She was one of a kind, and kindness was a calling card. Northeast Florida says goodbye to Fran Kinney, the former president at Jacksonville University. She was a visionary leader who empowered her students, and she always gave them access to her. Fran Kinney's way was never to seek the limelight, even though she was in it. It was never to take the credit, even though she deserved it. We're talking about the first female university president in Florida history. We also asked President Tim Cost about his commitment to reopen Jacksonville University to students in the fall and the challenges each school is facing. Plus, more accountability on the way for Jacksonville's scandal-rocked utility, a new effort by city council regarding JEA on This Week in Jacksonville. And welcome. Glad you're with us. This week, colleges and universities around the country started making known their plans either to reopen or to remain closed to on-campus instruction. Jacksonville University's choice is to make sure they're ready in August to have students back in Arlington. I spoke with President Tim Cost about the factors in that decision and the force of what COVID-19 has done. I think every university uh, is dealing with the COVID challenge in its own way. You can see Great schools like Harvard have now said that they believe their negative financial impact will be $1.2 billion. You see the University of Akron has already announced it's closing six of its 11 colleges. You can see what's happening. UVA, Stanford, MIT, Virginia Tech is talking about a quarter of a billion dollars. Lots and lots of information out there in this industry sector called higher education. It's the perfect Petri dish for a challenge. Young people in close proximity eating, living, <laughs> studying together frequently with professors in their lives who are in their 60s or more. So you, you take it and you kind of shake it up together. And we, like a lot of good universities, have been on this. Uh, late February, early March, uh, we dove into it hard. And then as professional sports leagues and other organizations started shutting things down in this March 10 to 15 window, we started to do the same. So to the point of what are we doing now? We put a team together, uh, and they've been together literally every single day now going on more than 65 days that has epidemiologists, infectious disease experts, experts in teaching and technology, experts in marketing and communications. And we've been looking at every aspect of the arc of the experience for the student. Can you bring them back safely? Will they be able to fly if we get them here? Our basic tenants, testing, tracing, spacing, all right, that on the front end, in the middle, what's the interesting, imaginative, innovative programming you can put together? How can you use this extraordinary weather, 250 acres on the waterfront, an awful lot of space here where we could do some teaching differently. We don't have any classes where two or 300 students are in a place together. We don't do it. I don't believe in it. That's a lot of universities do that. They do that well, and I congratulate them. But that's not why students come to Jacksonville University to sit in a class with 500 of their peers. And then on the back end, the hard work, Kent, is in the event that there is uh, any kind anywhere in Jacksonville, Florida, or in Arlington, or on our campus, if there's a case where someone gets sick, last time around, presidents like me used a very blunt instrument. You shut the hall, you shut the building, you shut the campus, you send everybody home. That can't be the approach this time. We've had, we will have had by late August, which is more than 100 days from now, we're 65 days into something and looking at 100 days out, it's your ability to isolate, trace, and treat. And we have some really interesting ideas we're forming now. Uh, we have an incredible phys couple physical assets on the north side of our campus, which not too many universities have, both our brand new student uh, health center inside our academic health science complex and the Dolphin Point Landing graduated nursing care facility. Those two together are gonna to give us an opportunity to go from the front end where you're testing and tracing and spacing, the middle end where you're programming and the back end where you're mitigating and handling the risk. But good universities have to do it. It's gonna be a call that people make down the road, but we'll make it well before we get into the third week of August. President Kosh, you mentioned some of those other universities and the enormous cost, the negative on revenue or what have you. How is it impacting the university financially and it, because you're a smaller school does that help you or does it exacerbate the damage yeah i think it's a challenge for everybody financially usually in the university world it's a, a you know guys like me who came out of 32 years in corporate america here you know it's it's a great help if you have a large endowment so if you're harvard with a 37 billion dollar endowment or many many universities including in the private space have 1 billion dollar endowments or now 
our endowment is less than $100 million. So is it a challenge financially? Yeah, it's an enormous challenge. And the way we're looking at it now, we could see when this first emerged in March, that in the fiscal year we were in, March to the end of June, this took us from a positive year financially to a year where we were going to look at a deficit of perhaps as much as $4 million. And that was, we could see that right away. Uh, we've taken a number of steps. We've done furloughing, cost cutting. We've done salary cuts, myself and our team. We've gone ahead, done some terminations. We've done pullback on operating expenses. So this year, the financial year we're in that ends June 30, uh, looks fine. It's next year. And that's the year that everyone is sort of laying out. For a university like ours, this could be as much as an eight-figure challenge. This could be the sort of thing when you look at historically a university that runs roughly break-even to positive is now looking at a $10 million plus challenge. We know that. We're dealing with it. And there's a lot of things that slide in and out of there. How many students come who had previously committed? How many come back as sophomores, juniors, and seniors? Will they be on campus paying room and board? You know, there's a lot of moving parts to that. So we have six models that we're taking and we're moving up and down, but in none of them is this a positive in any way financially. First, we're worried about student, faculty, and staff health, then financial health. Well, there was a tough decision that you and the leaders at the university made last year uh, concerning football. Uh, I've heard that many mid-major programs in college athletics are going to have to be eliminated. Is that something that in this next year, this next fiscal, fiscal year, if you're looking at $10 million or more as a challenge, as you put it, is that something where sports may have to uh, say goodbye? Sure, I think that's already started. I mean, we made our decision, obviously, months and months pre-COVID. Um, Florida Tech has recently dropped football here just a couple of days ago. University of Cincinnati just announced it's dropping men's soccer. I mean, you're going to see that there's no question NCAA Division I athletics, which is the, the heartbeat, a big part of who this university is, including guys like me who probably would not have heard of this good university were it not for athletics, will continue to look at uh, what athletics can do. In the main, Division I athletics is a major, major positive for this university. It brings us students who wouldn't otherwise come. They're, they have a higher grade point average collectively. The 450 Division I student athlete undergrads who go here have a higher grade point average than the student body. It's very impressive. So it's not a place we would look first, but I think a lot of schools will take it into account. When we come back, a legend in higher education in Northeast Florida. President Cost guides us through the loss of Dr. Fran Kinney and the incredible legacy she leaves behind. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. You may not see them, but your itchy eyes know they're out there. Thousands of allergens in each cubic yard of air. No wonder you rub your eyes hundreds of times a day. But now, relief is just one drop away. Introducing Pataday. Full prescription strength Pataday works right in your eyes, right in the cells that make them itch. Fast, just one drop once a day means relief that lasts all day. So turn your day into a Pataday. Now get Pataday without a prescription. Everywhere. Hello, Jacksonville. Tri-County Metals has a new location in Jacksonville to help you with all your metal roofing needs. Tri-County Metals brings you affordability with low interest, low payment, no money down financing. Tri-County Metals brings you value with energy saving, energy star, cool metal roof colors. We bring you safety and security only a metal roof can provide. Get the roof you want, a new metal roof from Tri-County Metals. Tri-County Metals, now open in Jacksonville. Make your next roof your last. With funeral costs averaging over $10,000 and expected to be over $30,000 in 20 years, how can seniors pay for their funeral and not leave this debt to their families? Senior Life Insurance Company offers state-regulated life insurance plans to help cover your final expenses. Up to $30,000 in tax-free money. With plans around $12 a month, covering your final expenses has never been more affordable. This low rate is also locked in for life, and your coverage amount will never decrease. You also cannot be turned down for any health reason. You could qualify for full coverage from day one even if you have many common health issues like diabetes, high blood pressure, or arthritis. This is all done with no medical exam. Senior Life is now enrolling people for this important benefit, so call the number for free information. 
Don't miss this opportunity for free information on your available benefits. Make the free call now. Upgrading will double your down payment. We have the secret slide up for great new deals, just fine. Look right in the Kia Forte, you'll be feeling sporty. I'm driving Kia Soul, man, that hash was full. Get on down to South Side Kia. Oh, Kia of Orange Park today. Kia Jacks, online to the max. If you get your news on Facebook, important local stories could get lost in the timeline. Don't let Facebook decide what news you see. Stay connected with News 4 Jacks on Facebook Messenger and get the latest coronavirus updates directly to your inbox. Go to the News 4 Jacks page, tap the message button, then choose coronavirus. News 4 Jacks will DM you a personalized news feed every day. Get the news you need without ever touching the timeline. Moving forward together with News 4 Jacks on Facebook Messenger. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. We heard the news one week ago today. Frances Bartlett Kinney has passed away at the age of 102. Dr. Kinney was the first woman to become a university president in Florida, appointed president of Jacksonville University in 1979. Tim Cost was both a student at JU when Dr. Kinney was there, and that was influenced her as he now serves as the president. Well, thank you, Kent, for letting us talk about her today. She's been a part of all of our lives forever. You know, she came to Jacksonville in 1958 uh, on a one month assignment. And here she was uh, in May of 2020, not only still with us, but such a, a huge presence, a profound personal effect on me and my family, this university that I love and went to. Um, when I came back to serve here in late 2012, early 2013, she and I started speaking more than regularly. You know, with Fran, you could talk to her every day. She would email you late at night. And it is bittersweet because we're at a time right now, especially with her passing on Mother's Day and people, I think, rightfully noting kind of a mother to thousands and thousands of us undergrads who came through here. She became the president of the university while I was an undergraduate ball player here. So uh, she's had an incredible impact on all of us. And I think with her passing during this COVID challenge, it's remarkable. People have a bit more time, I think, either to be home or be online. So they're swapping stories and photos and memories, but you know, no one can hug each other. So it's a remarkable time, but it is bittersweet. I agree. Rick Mullaney shared a story with me this week that I had not heard that Dr. Kinney had gone out of her way to tell him how much she appreciated what Rick is our political analyst and what I do is our, our political reporter and what we brought to the community. And it was the first time I'd heard it, but I thought, gosh, that that was Fran Kinney. She was going out of her way to find ways to encourage and inspire other people, right? Yeah, Fran Kinney's way was never to seek the limelight, even though she was in it. It was never to take the credit, even though she deserved it. I mean, there's just a great long history of Fran, including in my life and others, of Fran finding ways to kind of buck up other people. You, you can do it. This, this tenacious optimism I've talked about for years, she was proud of it. It was, I don't know if it was natural from birth way back in May of 1917, but it became kind of her ethos and her persona, and it completely infiltrated and imbued this entire institution. And it was one of the things I loved about this school when I came here from New York way back as a, an 18-year-old was there was a there was an uplifting feeling about being here. There was a sort of, we can do this kind of thing. And that was Fran. And whether it was the work you did or the work others on our faculty did, she was always reaching them or reaching me to say, I hope you'll tell them and let's write a note too. And um, it was just constant. And it was, I've, I've used the term recently, it was impenetrable. Nobody ever tried to break down her optimism, but anytime she ran headlong into somebody who had a bit more of an Eeyore personality, she won that battle. It's been uh, some 30 years since I was an undergraduate, uh, almost 40 years since you were an undergraduate, but she served some 60 years. And even after retirement, still involved with the university. So here's my question for you, Tim Cost. Did she have more of an impact on you as the undergraduate at Jacksonville University or as the returning president now of that school that you graduated from? Uh, good, good way to look at it. I would say I hugely larger impact on me once I realized how great she was. The thing about coming to a college, and maybe people can understand, you come here as an 18, 19, 20-year-old, 
you're doing your own thing, you're playing your sports, you're studying. But I can remember when she kind of came into my life, you'd be walking out on the mound on a you know hot late April day or May day, and there she would be. We had no lights on the ballpark back then. So these were one o'clock games in Florida, and there she'd be in canary yellow or fire engine red or a bright white suit. But no question, reconnecting with her as closely as I did starting in the tail end of 2012 here into the middle of 2020, remarkable. She managed to keep herself current on what was going on, not just in higher ed, but in the, in the economy. She loved to talk about the stock market. She was always funny and witty. Um, there was no sense you ever had when you were talking to Fran that you were talking to someone 95, 98, 102 years old. It was remarkable. And that was probably the last thing I was going to mention is that, yeah, even in these uh, her later years, if you will, no sense that this was a centenarian, that uh, she had lost a mental edge at all. No, and I talked to her a lot about that idea of staying sharp mentally, emotionally, psychologically, because if you do what Fran did or you do what, say, I do now, where you're at lots of events, you're either giving speeches or people asking questions, there's a lot of energy kind of going out. And Fran seemed to be able to recharge it like great uh, performers or entertainers we know. She drew such energy from other people. And she was sort of famous for always being the last person to want to leave any Jacksonville University event. And I saw that firsthand. I learned that. I must admit, the president and the first lady (laughs) tend to show up early and stay late as opposed to bugging out. And, you know, she was often kind of ushering out the last people long after the event ended. And she stayed sharp and current. It was really something to see at 102. Many people in Jacksonville appreciate what Dr. Kinney gave in service to the area and especially to the students. Now, one of those compelling stories comes from Alvin Brown, a JU student who needed help on his way eventually to becoming mayor of the city. Fran Kinney was a type of person who was a, she put student first. She was a visionary leader who empowered her students and she always gave them access to her. So, you know, as a student, I couldn't pay my tuition uh, at one point, and I put together a business plan and went to go see Fran. And I said, Dr. Kenny, I need your help. Uh, I don't want to drop out of college. I said, I'm working at Win Dixie as a meat cutter, and I'll pay you in 60 days. And she said, Well, I didn't know you were working at Win Dixie. And uh, I said, Well, they told me I should, you know, take a year or two off and then come back. And so Fran Kenny literally said, I want you to go downstairs to the register. I'm going to call a controller and I want you to register for college. You don't owe us a dime. That was Fran Kenny. Uh, and I'm so thankful for that. Rick Mullaney, you've gotten to know, he's our political analyst and he's the director of the Public Policy Institute at Jacksonville University. He says he treasures time spent with Dr. Kenny over the years. I have a great picture with her that I could send you and share with you. It's a great picture of her kind of hugging me and smiling me on her 100th birthday. People have always talked so much about, you know, what she meant and what a trailblazer she was, which is all true. Let me tell you something, though. She's remarkable. I mean, God blessed Fran Kenny with remarkable qualities. She, she was as mentally sharp at 100, at 100 as most of us are at 21. She'd remember your name. She'd recall specific details of times you met. Uh, and she was so positive and, and made you feel good. She, she had that gift. I mean, she was a gifted, special woman. To many, to many. But boy, I'll tell you one thing. They, they, don't, make, they don't come like Frank Kinney very often. Absolutely true. So three years ago, we had a story here on This Week in Jacksonville about Dr. Kinney as she celebrated her 100th birthday she would have turned 103 this coming week. All right, as we move on, more changes this week at JEA. Up next, City Councilman Dr. Ron Salem discussing some legislation to take back some control from the utility. Stay with us on This Week in Jackson. Everything for spring. Weekday mornings on The Morning Show. From grills and gardens to local plants, spring projects, and Rebecca's weekly garden forecast. If you missed it, go to news4jacks.com's weather tab to catch up. Sponsored by Fox Farm Soil and Fertilizer Company. Jacksonville, you voted. Now it's time to check out all the winners of Jack's Best. Head to newsforjacks.com slash Jack's Best to see who you picked as the best in every category. Presented by Visit Jacksonville. 
Some people say there are many Floridas, but in this moment, we are one. We might not share the same concerns, responsibility, joy, or fear, but we all share the same hope to stay healthy and get through this together. For 75 years, Florida Blues remained committed to the one place we call home. Even in a time filled with unknowns, one thing is for certain. This is not the first storm we've weathered together. And while this storm may look different, JEA's commitment to the community remains the same. Providing reliable energy, safe water, and right now, financial relief for those who need it. Because as your neighbors, friends, and family, we know the importance of staying connected to what matters most. To connect with us, visit JEA.com. During the coronavirus pandemic, Joe Biden criticized President Trump's China travel ban. Hysterical xenophobia. He was dead wrong. For 40 years, Biden's been wrong on China, supporting trade deals that destroy American jobs, giving China most favored nation status, letting China walk all over us. What a beautiful history we wrote together. But Biden has never been more wrong than now. Hysterical Joe xenophobia. Biden in the White House would be a deadly mistake. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. I'm Brian. You probably know someone who's had a heart attack, COPD, or a heart bypass operation. You might even know someone who's had a heart transplant, lung cancer, or part of their lung removed. But what about someone who's had all six? Now you do. My tip is, if smoking doesn't get you one way, it'll get you another. Quit your way. Visit TobaccoFreeFlorida.com. Staying informed is more important than ever. When news breaks, find out fast. Get breaking news alerts sent directly to you. Important updates from the people you know and trust. Subscribe today only on News4Jax.com. Everything for spring. Weekday mornings on The Morning Show. From grills and gardens to local plants, spring projects, and Rebecca's weekly garden forecast. If you missed it, go to News4Jax.com's weather tab to catch up. Sponsored by Fox Farm Soil and Fertilizer Company. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. JEA roared back into Jacksonville's collective consciousness in the past few weeks with a grand jury subpoena for information. And some of the documents requested focus on a widely panned proposal for extravagant bonuses. City Councilman Dr. Ron Salem joins us now. And Dr. Salem, I know you probably have, you've got some thoughts, I'm sure, on that, uh, that performance unit plan that eventually was, was scrapped. You've also got some legislation here that doesn't deal with that, but still is about bonuses for JEA employees. Why don't you tell me what's in this uh, bill that you're proposing? Uh, Kent, the JEA has had a yearly or what we call a short-term incentive plan since 1990. It's 30 years old has been paid every year other than a few years during the Great Recession of the 06-08 period. Um, it, it costs the JEA about four to seven million dollars a year and I feel like in the last two to three years it's been mismanaged and I want to put some additional controls on it. Why do you feel it's mismanaged and where would the controls come from this, this accountability? That we're well, the, the JEA board, the previous board and the board before that both gave the authority to total compensation to the CEO, which I'm not comfortable with. I, I think the board should be approving all compensation plans. In the past year, in January of, of 2019, they gave that authority to Aaron Zahn, which was part of the uh, development of the long-term incentive plan, or PUP, as well as this plan. So he basically developed a short-term incentive plan and collected off that plan in uh, October of 2019 for $31,000. And I, I don't believe that anyone that designs that plan and has approval of that plan should be collecting from that plan. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, but this wasn't something that Aaron Zahn instituted. This happened before he right. was CEO, right? Yeah, but, but my concern is the board, for reasons that aren't clear to me, uh, twice in the last three years have delegated that authority to the CEO. Um, I, I think the board gets comfortable with the CEO and begins delegating that authority and my ordinance does uh, is keeps that authority with the board. The board has to approve the plan, submits it to the city where our council auditors review it, make sure it's appropriate, 
and then it goes to the council. What the council will be doing is approving a broad-based plan. We're not going to be approving 2,000 specific bonuses. We're approving a plan that will then pay out to those people if the board submits it to us. As I understand it, some of the concern is that the bonuses wouldn't necessarily be in the budget uh, that would be presented to city council, right? That's the other part that really bothers me. The, the, the JEA is required to submit their budget to the, to the city for review by the council auditors. This specific plan has not been submitted uh, as a part of their budget to the, to, the, uh, to the city. And the explanation is, if we save money in our budget, then we pay out the bonus. And uh, I'm not comfortable with that. I want to see the plan. I want to make sure their, their, uh, their budget is appropriate so that any money savings that occur are appropriate savings and where a, a bonus can be paid. This is something that would just be approved or disapproved in, in city council, or does this go to voters at some point? Well, that's the other interesting part of this. Because we're changing the authority, we're moving the authority, uh, if it does pass, of this plan from the uh, JEA to the city council, it, re it requires a referendum. So if this, if this is passed by the city council in about four weeks, it will then go on the November ballot. Okay. And, and maybe we wrap up here, but this really came out of some of the disturbing things we were hearing last fall, and I think you mentioned even in December a meeting that you and Councilman Diamond had, Yeah, right? Councilman Diamond and I had a hearing in December which kind of blew the performance unit planner pup, yeah. uh, uh, exploded at that point. And uh, we also uncovered some issues with employee contracts, which we're addressing through the Boylan uh, uh, committee that's looking at changes to the charter. We're looking at several changes to the charter that hopefully will control these type of things in the future. Unfortunately, this one and one that changes the composition of the board in terms of who appoints them, right. uh, the council gets four, also will go on the ballot as a referendum. It's, well, it's one of the things that people of Jacksville want. They want a say in what's happening with this uh, publicly owned utility and certainly want to see more accountability. Hey, Councilman, I appreciate it, uh, and I know the people who are watching are saying, uh, we're thankful that our city council is after this. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Well, in the coming weeks, Congressman Ted Yoho is on the schedule before he winds up uh, what he says is his last year on Capitol Hill. We've also been working to bring in State Senator Audrey Gibson. Plan on that for next week. This week in Jacksonville, airs each Sunday morning at this time. And I'm Ted Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17. And you can find us online at news4jax.com. Every day, more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida and South Georgia's number one source for local news.